Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number eight of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled Teaching Disciples Part 2 and is ready for teaching on Sabbath, August 24. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, August 17. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that during the life of Jesus and those few years he spent with his disciples, that he taught them so much and that it's been recorded in the Gospels and particularly in the Gospel of Mark as we read these stories this week, as we listen to what Jesus has to say, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us that our hearts may be opened and filled with not only knowledge but with joy and grace because of what Jesus has done for us. Bless us, we pray. And also today I'd like to pray particularly for Brother Dennis Juma in Kenya and also his family and Winston White in Brooklyn, New York and Amanda Mandy in South Africa and Charles Christian from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil who's learning English through these Sabbath school lessons. Lord, bless each of them and their families and for everyone who's listening, Lord, May their family and their life be enriched, not just by this lesson, but by your Holy Spirit working in their lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And Claudia is going to read that for us again. Thank you, Claudia. I'm Claudia from Harvey Bay and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 10 verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This week covers Mark chapter 10, completing the special section in which Jesus teaches his disciples in preparation for the cross. About half of the chapter deals with the disciples themselves and the rest with issues important to discipleship but told through the lens of others who interact with Jesus. Pharisees come and argue with him over the subject of divorce. Parents bring their children for Jesus to bless. A rich man asks about eternal life and a blind man asks for sight. This chapter of Mark carries important teachings about what it means to follow Jesus, particularly as it relates to living in the here and now. Marriage, children, how to relate to riches, and the reward and cost of following him. Topping it off is the healing of a second blind man in Mark 10, 46-52, and we'll compare that with Mark 8, 26, which provides the closing bookend for the section in Mark 8, 22 10, 52, and a beautiful illustration of what following Jesus both costs and leads to. Together, These lessons prepare the follower of Jesus, whether the disciples of 2,000 years ago or disciples in the 21st century, for the challenge that comes with discipleship. And we'll check out those two healing miracles in Mark chapter 8 and 10 later in this week's lesson. Sunday, August 18, God's Plan for Marriage Read Mark 10, verses 1 to 12, as well as Genesis 1, 27 and Genesis 2, 24. What trap was hiding under the Pharisees' question about divorce and what lessons did Jesus teach in his response? We start with Mark 10 and verse 4. Jesus then left that place and went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, 
Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. He answered, Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Genesis one twenty seven reads, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. And Genesis 2 verse 24, That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. In this passage, the Pharisees ask Jesus if it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Among the Pharisees, divorce was considered lawful. The question was on what grounds? The school of Shammai was arguably more restrictive only for childlessness, material neglect, emotional neglect or marital unfaithfulness. The school of Hillel was much more lenient, allowing divorce for almost any reason, though their process of granting the divorce was more complex, helping to slow things down. So, it may seem a bit odd that they ask Jesus the blanket question, if divorce is acceptable at all. Hiding under this question was a plot to get Jesus in trouble with Herod Antipas, the ruler of the region to the east of the Jordan, where Jesus was now. Antipas had divorced his wife and married Herodias, his brother's wife. Herod had beheaded John the Baptist because of his rebuke regarding his illicit relationship, as we read previously in Matthew 14, but let's do that again. Matthew 14, verses 1 to 12. At that time Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the reports about Jesus, and he said to his attendants, This is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead. That is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, Herod had arrested John and bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. For John had been saying to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. Herod wanted to kill John, but he was afraid of the people because they considered John a prophet. On Herod's birthday, the daughter of Herodias danced for the guests and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he ordered that her request be granted and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. John's disciples came and took his body and buried it. Then they went and told Jesus. Jesus parries their question with his own, asking the Pharisees what Moses commanded on the matter. The passage the Pharisees reference in reply is Deuteronomy 24 and verses 1 to 4. Let's have a look at that. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house or if he dies... Then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. 
which describes a particular case of remarriage after divorce. That's Deuteronomy 24. The Israelites in Moses' day were already practicing divorce. The case law described in Deuteronomy 24 was meant to provide protections for the woman, but in Jesus' day this was twisted by the school of Hillel to make it easier to get a divorce for almost any reason. Thus, the law that was meant to protect the woman was being used to make it easy to thrust her aside. Instead of debating the case law in Deuteronomy 24, Jesus refers back to God's original ideal for marriage in Genesis 1 and 2. He notes that in the beginning, God made a man and a woman, in Genesis 1.27, two individuals. He then combines this truth with Genesis 2.24, which says that a man leaves his parents and is joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. This concept of unity becomes the basis of Jesus' affirmation of the marriage bond. What God has joined, people should not separate. And so to finish the day, what can your congregation do to strengthen the marriages among you? And... How do you help those whose marriages have already fallen apart? Monday, August 19. Jesus and Children Read Mark chapter 10, verses 13 to 16. What did Jesus do for those who brought children to him? Mark 10, beginning at verse 13, people were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. And he took the children in his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. While children were desired in the ancient world, particularly boys in the male-dominant culture, birth and childhood were not easy. Without modern medical care, the risks to mothers in giving birth and to newborn infants and children were elevated. Many cultures had traditional medicines and amulets used to protect these vulnerable individuals against malevolent forces. While children were desired, they were of low social status, along the lines of slaves, actually. Well, we read this in Galatians 4, 1 and 2. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set, by his father. In the Greco-Roman world, those who were deformed or undesirable would be exposed or even tossed in a river. Boys were valued over girls. Sometimes girls' babies were left to die among the elements. At times these abandoned babies were rescued only to be raised and sold as slaves. The disciples appear not to have understood Jesus' teaching in Mark 9 about receiving the kingdom of God like a little child, as we read there in Mark 9, 33-37. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me does not welcome me but the one who sent me. Now they rebuke those who brought children to Jesus for blessing, perhaps thinking that he would not have time for such a simple task. They were wrong. Jesus is indignant. Throughout Mark, Jesus has some striking reactions to people, and it is instructive that one of his strong reactions was toward people who were keeping children away from him. 
He strongly insists that the disciples must not stand in the way of the children. Why? Because the kingdom of God belongs to them, and one must receive it in the attitude and outlook of a child, probably a reference to simple, implicit trust in God. Ellen White writes in the Ministry of Healing, pages 43 and 44, Let not your unchristlike character misrepresent Jesus. Do not keep the little ones away from him by your coldness and harshness. Never give them cause to feel that heaven would not be a pleasant place to them if you were there. Do not speak of religion as something that children cannot understand or act as if they were not expected to accept Christ in their childhood. Do not give them the false impression that the religion of Christ is a religion of gloom and that in coming to the Saviour they must give up all that makes life joyful. End of quote. And so to finish today, how can you better reveal Jesus to whatever children are around you? Tuesday, August 20. The Best Investment. Read Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. What crucial lessons about faith and the cost of discipleship for anyone, rich or poor, is revealed here. Mark 10, beginning at verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. The man's approach indicates his sincerity and respect for Jesus. He runs up, kneels before him, and asks the question central to the destiny of every soul. What are the requirements in order to inherit eternal life? Jesus responds by referring to the second table of the Decalogue. Again, the man shows his idealism by saying that he has kept all these, even from his youth. Of the four Gospels, Mark alone notes that Jesus loved the man. There is something appealing about the man's idealism, but Jesus tests his sincerity by asking him to sell everything and to follow him. The man leaves crestfallen because he had great possessions. In fact, he was not really keeping the commandments. He broke the first one, placing something above God in his life. His riches were his idol. 
Jesus then explains how seductive riches are and that it is easier for a big animal like a camel to go through the tiny hole of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter heaven. The disciples are astonished by Jesus' words and wonder who can be saved. Jesus delivers the punchline in Mark 10.25. With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Mark 10.27 seems like a beautiful place to end the story. You cannot make it to heaven on your own. You need the grace of God in order to be saved. But then Peter blurts out that he and his friends have left everything to follow Jesus. Jesus responds that whatever you have left to follow him is nothing in contrast to what you will receive now and in the age to come. Here is the point. It is the death of Christ that resolves human guilt, and then the grace of Christ and his resurrection are what empower obedience to his commands. And so to finish today, we're going to read Romans 6 verses 1 to 11. How do these verses reveal the reality of God's grace in our lives, both in justifying us and in making us new people in Him? Let's begin verse 1 of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptised into Christ Jesus were baptised into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Wednesday, August 21. Can you drink my cup? Read Mark chapter 10, verses 32 to 45. How do these verses reveal the continued ignorance of the disciples regarding not only Jesus' mission, but what it means to follow him? Chapter 10 of Mark, beginning at verse 32. They were on their way to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to them. We are going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles, who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. 
When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. As Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he reveals to his disciples what will happen there. It is not a scenario they believe in or want to hear. Jesus' specificity as to the outline of his death and resurrection is striking. But when it is not what you want to hear, it is all too easy to dismiss. This is apparently what James and John do as they come to Jesus with a private request. Jesus rightly asks for more specifics, and they respond that they want to sit on his right and left in his glory. It is easy to criticise their request as rank egocentricism. But these two men have dedicated themselves to Jesus' ministry, and their desires were probably not wholly selfish in nature. Jesus seeks to deepen their understanding of just what they are requesting, he asks if they can drink his cup or be baptised with his baptism. His cup will be the cup of suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross. And here we compare with Mark 14, verse 36. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And his baptism will be his death and burial, as we read in Mark 15, verses 33 to 47. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. And that's where events there parallel his baptism recorded in Mark chapter 1. But James and John do not see it. They glibly reply that they are able. Jesus then prophesies that indeed they will drink his cup and be baptised with his baptism. James was the first of the apostles to die a martyr's death, as we read in Acts chapter 12 verse 2. 
he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. John was the longest lived of the apostles and was exiled to Patmos, as we read in Revelation 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus, was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. But Jesus indicates that places in glory are set by God. How did the other disciples respond to Jesus' answer? Not too well. The same Greek word, aganakakteo, to be angry or indignant, is used in Mark 10.41 as in Mark 10 verse 14 regarding Jesus' anger over keeping the children away from him. Mark 10.41 reads, When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. And verse 14, When Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Jesus then calls the group together to give one of his most profound teachings. He indicates that Gentile rulers use power for personal advantage. But in the kingdom of God, power must always be used to uplift and bless others. Jesus leads the way as the king of the kingdom of God. How? By giving his own life as a ransom. Not quite what his followers expected to hear. And so to finish today... What does it mean as a Christian to be a servant to others? That is, how do you manifest this principle in your daily interaction with people? Thursday, August 22. What do you want me to do for you? Read Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. How did Bartimaeus react to Jesus passing by? Mark 10, beginning at verse 46. Then they came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside bedding. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Up to this point in the Gospel of Mark, with few exceptions, Jesus has been telling people to keep quiet about his miracles and about who he is. In this account, as he is leaving Jericho, a blind man, begging on the side of the road, upon hearing that it is Jesus of Nazareth, begins to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, in verse 47. In keeping with the revelation secrecy motif of the book, the crowd takes on the role of those calling for silence as they unsuccessfully try to quiet the noisy beggar. But, Bartimaeus is undeterred and shouts even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me, in verse 48. His words are both a confession of faith in Jesus as the Messiah and confidence that he can heal him. The title, Son of David, in Jesus' day had two concepts connected with it. The restoration of a king to Israel's throne and that this personage would be a healer and exorcist. And we're going to compare what happened in Isaiah chapter 11. And we read beginning at verse 1, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. 
The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of might, the Spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy. With justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, and faithfulness the sash around his waist. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the earth. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his resting place will be glorious. In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the surviving remnant of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the Mediterranean. He will raise a banner for the nations and gather the exiles of Israel. He will assemble the scattered people of Judah from the four quarters of the earth. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish, and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile toward Ephraim. They will swoop down on the slopes of Philistia to the west. Together they will plunder the people to the east. They will subdue Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites will be subject to them. The Lord will dry up the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates River. He will break it up into seven streams, so that anyone can cross over in sandals. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people that is left from Assyria, as there was for Israel when they came up from Egypt. And then we also read in Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteous Saviour. And Jeremiah 33 verse 15, In those days and at that time I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. And Ezekiel 34 verses 23 and 24, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. And Ezekiel 37 verse 24, My servant David will be king over them, and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. And Micah chapter 5 verses 2 3 and 4. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. And Zechariah chapter 3 verse 8, Listen, high priest Joshua, you and your associates seated before you, who are men symbolic of things to come. I am going to bring my servant, the branch. And Zechariah 6, verse 12. Tell him this is what the Lord Almighty says. 
Here is the man whose name is the branch, and he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. Jesus stops and tells them to call the blind man. Significantly, the blind man throws off his cloak as he comes to Jesus. Blind people in Jesus' day were at the bottom of society, along with widows and orphans. These were individuals below subsistence level and in real peril. The cloak would be the man's security. Leaving it behind meant he had faith that Jesus would heal him. Jesus does not disappoint. Indeed, whoever comes to him for help in the Gospels always receives it. Jesus asks the same question he asked James and John in Mark 10.36. What do you want me to do for you? And there it is in verse 51. Without hesitation, the blind man asks to receive his sight, which Jesus immediately restores. The blind man follows him on the road. This story is the close of the discipleship section in Mark, serving as a bookend with the other story of healing a blind man in Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. The two stories illustrate how discipleship is about seeing the world with new eyes, sometimes not clearly at first, but always following Jesus in the way he leads. And so to finish the day, In what ways have you at times cried out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me? What happened? And what did you learn from this experience? Friday, August 23. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 511, we read... Jesus was ever a lover of children. He accepted their childish sympathy and their open, unaffected love. The grateful praise from their pure lips was music in his ears and refreshed his spirit when oppressed by contact with crafty and hypocritical men. Wherever the Saviour went, the benignity of his countenance and his gentle, kindly manner won the love and confidence of children, end of quote. And from the same book, page 523, to those who, like the young ruler, are in high positions of trust and have great possessions, it may seem too great a sacrifice to give up all in order to follow Christ. But this is the rule of conduct for all who would become his disciples. Nothing short of obedience can be accepted. Self-surrender is the substance of the teachings of Christ. Often it is presented and enjoined in language that seems authoritative, because there is no other way to save man than to cut away those things which, if entertained, will demoralize the whole being. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, what are ways that you can help children and young people stay connected to Christ and the church congregation? Why is it so important that we do this? Two, we sometimes hear people say that they don't care about money. That's not true. Everyone cares about money and there is nothing wrong with that. What then can be the problem with money? And why must faithful Christians, either rich or poor, be careful in how they relate to money? Three, if Jesus were to ask you, What do you want me to do for you? How would you respond? And question four. Dwell more on Jesus' words in Mark 10, 43 to 45. What does it mean to live like this? Mark 10, 43. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. How do we learn to serve as opposed to being served? And what does this mean in regard to how we live and interact with others?
And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Home Turned into a Church by Andrew McChesney Father kept his word about organising Sabbath worship services at home in Armenia. Having prohibited mother and their daughter, Anush, from going to the Seventh-day Adventist church, he called them to the living room on Sabbath morning. For Sabbath school, they studied the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide and prayed together, and then Anush preached a short sermon. The worship services continued for months. Father, who had never visited an Adventist church, was so serious about the worship services that, if guests were visiting, he invited them to the living room, opened his Bible and said, Welcome to our worship service. Today is the Sabbath and you can join us. This was not the Armenian way. In Armenia, hosts leave everything to entertain guests. Guests were shocked and wondered what was going on. As the family worshipped together, Father realised that he didn't know the Bible. In Matthew 4, the family read how Jesus met every temptation by Satan with the words, It is written. Father was impressed. He saw that he wouldn't know if Satan was tempting him if he didn't know the Bible. From that day, he began to read the Bible daily. As he read, he also sought answers to why he and his family were worshipping on the seventh day, Saturday, while many Christians in Armenia worship on the first day, Sunday. Father had vowed that Anush and mother would never return to the Adventist church, and he wanted to keep his word. Anush very much missed church services, but she hid her feelings because she understood that her duty was to love her father and wait for God to bring him to repentance. But when she learned that the Adventist house church in their town was preparing for a communion Sabbath, she asked father for permission to go. Aminya is a largely patriarchal society where many fathers are the decision makers of the household. Would you allow us to take part in the communion service, she asked, father. Communion, father said, you know I can lead that ceremony too. Nobody went to communion that Sabbath. Then father and mother became grandparents. Anush had an older sister who had gotten married and left home and she gave birth to a baby. Mother learnt that the baby and the rest of the family had been lifted up in prayer at church. They prayed for us in church, and I want to take something sweet to them as a thank you gift, she told Father. Father's heart was touched by the kindness of the church members, and he allowed Anush and Mother to return to church. Part of last quarter's 13th Sabbath offering went to open a centre of influence for families like Anush in Yerevan, Armenia. I'm reading these quarters Sabbath school lessons, looking out, listening to the birds tweeting while the kangaroos are pasturing in the backyard.